Very good evening, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Confabulating. It's our pleasure to be joined tonight by Professor Peter Wilson of All Souls College, Oxford, who will be delivering a talk entitled Lutzen, Great Battles. Professor Wilson is the Chichley Professor of the History of War and has been an academic fellow at All Souls since 2015. He's also the chair of the Oxford Centre for European History and the chair of the academic board of the Changing Character of the War Centre and a member of the editorial board of War and Society. Prior to that, he has held positions at the universities of Hull, Sunderland and Newcastle, and has also partaken in conferences and workshops at the National War College of Washington, DC and North Point University in North Carolina. He was also the director of research and deputy head of department at Hull from 2008 to 2015, and an external assessor for the German government higher education research funding program for initiative for excellence in 2007 and 2012. In addition, he has co-curated with Dr. Thomas Biscuit, uh, Great Britain, America, and the Atlantic World, a section of the Friedrich Seiko Frederick the Great Exhibition at the Neues Palais Potsdam in Germany from the 28th of April to the 28th of October in 2012. He's written a number of books uh, from 1995 to 2018 on a wide variety of subjects, such as the Thirty Years' War, uh, the Holy Roman Empire, early modern Europe, the early modern history of, German, of the German military, and more recently in 2018, a book dedicated to the Battle of Lützen that we'll be discussing tonight. And his main research interests include the history of war in wider Europe and world development from the 17th century to 1900, as well as early modern German history, especially the political, military, social, and cultural history of the Holy Roman Empire from 1495 to 1806. Professor Wilson, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for the very kind introduction and the invitation. Um, so I'm going to try and um, share my screen uh, with any luck. Uh, here we go. All right. Uh, right. Perfect. OK, here we go. Right. So what I'm going to try to do to, um, tonight is to talk about, to use the example of the Battle of Lutzen to unpick what we mean by um, a decisive battle and to also to try to sort of think a bit more about early modern warfare and the changes that are on, that are going um, in the particularly in the 17th century so <clears throat> there are actually two battles that are known as the battle of Lutzen there's the battle of Lutzen the main one I'm talking about which happened in November of um, 1632 and sees the death of the Swedish king Gustavus Adolphus at the, at the height of the battle and you have a very romanticized 19th century image of that uh, on the left hand side of the screen. On the right hand side of the screen, you can see an equally romanticized uh, 19th century image of the other battle, which is um, fought in May of 1813 um, between Napoleon uh, and the French forces and the uh, um, Russian and Prussian coalition forces. So the first battle, the Battle of Lutzen in 1632, involved 39,000 combatants, of whom around 10,000 became casualties. There's the second battle is much larger. It has 233,000 combatants, of whom over 33,000 become casualties. So it has six times the number of soldiers engaged, and it has over three times the number of killed and wounded. And yet, whereas the first battle in the 17th century is very remembered, and I'll be saying something more later about its commemoration. The second battle really is forgotten unless you're a Napoleonic Wars buff. And even the name uh, in German, it's known as Großkirchen, which is a village to the south of Lützen. And the fact that the name Lützen has been chosen at all, it owes actually much more to the proximity of the earlier battle site than the actual battle site in, in um, in 1813. So what I want to do is to, as I say, to try to understand why this should be so. Why, why are we focused on this much smaller battle? And the main reason is that it's been taken as an example of what is considered a decisive battle. So I want to try, as I say, to, to un unpick some of that. One of the key reasons for um, the historical reputation of the Battle of Lützen, and from now on when I'm talking about the Battle of Lützen, I mean the one in the 17th century, is that is the belief that the Thirty Years' War, and it's fought at the kind of high point of the Thirty Years' War, um, saw a clear 
transition from one type of warfare, and this is a warfare which is supposedly based on mercenaries who were employing, so again, allegedly cumbersome tactics associated with the emperor and the so-called Catholic forces on the one side in the conflict, to a more recognizably modern system of a national army employing a combination of shock and firepower, and that's associated with the Swedish side. And this in turn rests on an even more fundamental assumption that military developments are largely of a, one of a linear progress, often um, having been driven by technology. And that underpins the idea of the military revolution, which is a major sort of way of understanding the um, 16th and the 17th century, but it's, much, it's, it's a much bigger um, underlying assumption. And it owes a lot to the 19th century um, German historian Hans Delbruch and the way in which this idea of a kind of stadial progress in history and each stage in warfare is then supposedly exemplified by what we might call a paradigm army, an army which somehow defines the age. So the Thirty Years' War supposedly sees a transition from the Spanish army, which was the uh, major power of the 16th century, being replaced by um, a kind of Dutch school of the opponents of the, of the Spanish at the end of the 16th century through to Gustavus Adolphus and the Swedes, who um, supposedly then perfected these tactics. And then, then we move on later in the 17th century to um, uh, Louis XIV and the French army. So the battle that we're looking at sees the man on the left, Gustavus Adolphus, um, the King of Sweden, against the Imperial Army under Albrecht um, von Wallenstein. And it's fought at the, the, the as I say, at the, um, the height of the Thirty Years' War. And the Thirty Years' War in, begins in 1618, but really by 1629, it was effectively over. The emperor had won, and he was busy imposing a settlement on all of his opponents. And this process was then rudely interrupted by the landing of the Swedes about a year later, so in June of 1630, on the Pomeranian coast. So if you look at the map on the, on the left and you look at the blue arrow, this comes out of Sweden into the kind of salmon orangey pink area, which is the area really of the Lutheran northern German territories. And the blue line then indicates the, the movement of the Swedish army um, in this campaign from 1631 um, uh, through to the death of Gustavus at Lutzen. Uh, which is roughly in the middle of the map. So when Gustavus lands, uh, he's virtually without allies. Even his own brother-in-law, the elector of Brandenburg, says, you know, he's a foreign prince who has no business in our land. So this idea that he comes in as the great Protestant saviour, this is a, it's, it's basically a subsequent propaganda. It's not until he wins the battle of Breitenfeld in September of 30, 1631 that it seems a safe bet. Now we can come over and we can join the Swedes and we might be able to um, restore our defeated position, those, those territories that decide to, to join him. And this victory of Breitenfeld is facilitated by the defection of Saxony, um, which is, again, this is where Lutzen is, that's in, in the electorate of Saxony, which changes sides and joins the Swedes very reluctantly. And having won the Battle of Breitenfeld, um, Gustavus moves south into the kind of Catholic heartlands. Um, and this process is then interrupted by the reconstruction of the Imperial Army, which has been defeated at Breitenfeld. It's rebuilt under Wallenstein, who regroups the army in Bohemia, and then advances in, uh, after some manoeuvring, they advance into Saxony, and that threatens essentially to cut um, the communications between Gustavus, who's now in the German southwest, and the south, and his northern bridgehead in Pomerania. So he has to come back to Saxony, and this is late in the campaign season, so we're now entering November, um, and this is not the time when you normally want to fight, you want to enter winter quarters, so both armies have much at stake here, and you can see that Lutzen lies um, just to the uh, southwest of Leipzig. So um, Wallenstein is, is um, trying to block uh, uh, the Swedes, which are moving uh, through Naumburg and Weissenfels from um, their move northwards into Saxony. So this is where um, Wallenstein decides to, to try to 
to block the, uh, the Swedes from, from coming into Saxony. So the battle is fought um, when the Swedish army comes up from the south, uh, the south, south southwest, <laughs> Uh, and uh, comes up against the imperial army, which is smaller, which is trying to hold this position along um, the, uh, a series of uh, streams. So a stream that runs basically diagonally, and you can see the stream there, the Mulgraben, which is a kind of mill stream for floating logs. And so the, um, the Swedish army um, decides to try to go around the flank of the, of the imperial army. The imperial army redeploys. Um, which you can see in the, in the diagonal line to the top um, right-hand corner, they deploy along a road and the Swedish army crosses and deploys in front of them. So Wallenstein at this point has only got slightly less than 14,000 soldiers and the Swedes have nearly 19,000. And in the process of the battle, um, which we can see, so the, the slide on the uh, the picture on the uh, left shows the initial deployment. Once the Swedes have got over the over the stream, um, they then make an attack with their right wing, trying to um, cut round the flank of the Imperial Army. Um, that has some success, um, which you can see on the um, uh, map on the right hand side. Um, but Wallenstein has sent a letter to uh, a detachment which was made earlier. To Pap under Pappenheim, which is, consists of both cavalry and infantry. So these are racing to the battlefield. You can see the letter. If you ever manage to go to the um, Military History Museum in Vienna, this letter is on display. And the kind of brown um, margin to the letter is actually Pappenheim's blood. So um, Pappenheim gets killed and the, the letter that has summoned him to the battlefield is later found on his, on his body. So he arrives with cavalry. He makes a a counterattack um, that's beaten off, um, and the battle really comes to a standstill as the imperial forces have been beaten back, but they have by and large held most of the ground. And um, you can see that on the um, left flank, uh, so of the Swedish forces, those arrows indicate at nightfall that the Swedes are actually withdrawing. They've not managed to completely break um, the imperial position and um, Pappenheim's infantry have finally managed to, to arrive. So they're sort of beginning to redress some of the, the balance. Um, what, you can, what you can see there on the um, right-hand side is some of the battlefield archeology span that's been undertaken. And this is um, a casualty um, and he has a musket ball. So part of the loading process often meant that you kept the ball in your mouth while you were um, priming the, uh, the powder. And he's been clearly shot through uh, the top of his head um, and has died with the, with the, with the, uh, in the middle of loading. So you, can, you get a, a kind of indication of how vicious this fighting was. This is close quarters fighting much of the time, even with musketry, the range is very close. And this battle has been truly intense. Both armies are, um, are shaken and exhausted by the end of the day as night falls. So um, why should this, and this is where I'm gonna pause the event, just to sort of think why should this be remembered as a great Swedish victory, particularly as the Swedish king has meanwhile been killed in the process. And I'll say something more about that in a moment. Well, Wallenstein decides to evacuate um, the battlefield and he retreats, um, first of all, to Leipzig, and then he moves out of Saxony altogether. And this precipitous retreat means that many of the other garrisons that he's left in Saxony surrender very quickly. And so the Swedes, when they are recounting the battle and recording their haul of prisoners, for example, already include these garrisons. So it makes this look like a great imperial defeat. And to some extent, this is a, a definitely a tactical victory at this point because they have gained control um, of, uh, liberated their Saxon ally and have arrived in Saxony. But the overall strategic situation has actually got worse for the Swedes. Wallenstein still has collectively um, well over 100,000 men, mainly in Bohemia. Um, and the death of Gustavus is a real blow. 
because Gustavus leaves um, a very young daughter and um, the Chancellor of Sweden, Axel Oxenstierna, is now in charge. And while Oxenstierna can cobble together an alliance of some of the Protestant German territories, he lacks um, Gustavus's charisma. He's not a king. Um, and so the Swedish position diplomatically begins um, to erode. And um, in 1634, Spanish reinforcements arrive. And there is the Battle of Nördlingen, which is a major Swedish defeat in southern Germany and results in the partial collapse of the Swedish position and allows the emperor to make another peace, which could have worked had he rather made that peace a bit more astutely and made more concessions. And his, so he overplays his hand. So this is by no means a decisive victory in the sense it hasn't ended the war. The Swedes haven't gained any more territory within in a few years. They're actually in a seriously weak position and it's actually their opponent's political mistakes that allow them ultimately to, to recover. So why is it that we remember this then um, as, a, as, a, as a great Swedish victory? Well, one of the things is the comparison between the two commanders and, and their subsequent reputations. Um, so this is, especially Gustavus's reputation as a, what is known really as a great captain. And that was there already at the present, um, at the time. If you read Robert Monroe's account, um, this is a fascinating account written by a Scottish soldier who is in the Swedish army. Uh, you know, he is, he just loves Gustavus. He's, you know, he cannot think of a better general. And, he's, and much of his book is about generalship. So there's a lot of hero worship already. And, this continues. So Basil Littlehart, the sort of leading British military theorist of the early 20th century, writes a book actually, which is called Great Captains. And this projects very much that kind of interpretation of Gustavus. If you contrast it with Wallenstein, Wallenstein um, was increasingly distrusted in the immediate aftermath of the battle. He falls victim to a conspiracy of jealous officers who persuade the emperor um, to sack sanction his judicial murder. They say he's going to defect. He wasn't actually going to defect, but once he finds out that they're going to murder him, he tries to defect. And you can see on the um, uh, left-hand side of the, of the screen, there's a depiction of, of Wallenstein being murdered by um, Irish and, uh, and Scottish dragoon officers who are in the Imperial Army. So we have Wallenstein, the devious, uh, individual who's considered more an organizer uh, than a general, um, who is then comes to this very sticky end, whereas Gustavus, and here we have another um, romanticized 19th century image, dies uh, in the midst of his victory, the, the hero's death uh, in battle, and he's seen very much as the kind of pious um, leader. So this contrast with the, between the two um, is, is already indicates why we're beginning to, to, to get this, this picture. If we compare also the way in which the interpretation extends to the armies that are engaged in this, there is the belief um, in the 19th and the 20th century that Gustavus created the kind of army that people in the 19th and 20th century thought an army should look like. Um, so this was supposedly a national army composed of motivated Swedes, controlled by the state and used for the benefit of the nation. And it's, it seemed the argument is that they are pursuing a strategy of decision, trying to seek battle and destroy the enemy quickly. Um, and this interpretation definitely draws very much on the contemporary 17th century hagiography of Gustavus and the, especially Swedish propaganda of the time, which emphasized uh, Gustavus as, a, as a, a, a pious Protestant. And again, we have another 19th century image. Here he is praying for um, the battle. So this is the idea that the Swedes are motivated, they're fighting for a cause, and that contrasts with supposedly the characteristic of the Imperial Army, um, who are depicted as rootless mercenaries raised and commanded by uh, entrepreneurs. And, and Wallenstein is the leading figure there. Um, supposedly the uh, the last of the condottieri of these kind of mercenary captains. Um, the Imperial Army is said that they, they plunder civilians, they undermine the army's operational effectiveness, and this is all contrasted um, to the 
to the Swedes who supposedly are content with their rations. And any shortcomings on the Swedish side are always invariably blamed on the presence of allied troops rather than the Swedes themselves. Well, in fact, um, three quarters of the Swedish force that was present at the Battle of Lützen were actually um, Germans, uh, either raised by Sweden um, earlier on or provided by its allies. Uh, and there were also some Scottish and English troops on the, on the side there too. And the famous Swedish Articles of War, um, which are supposed to have instilled all of this discipline, are basically plagiarised from the Imperial Articles of War from the 16th century. Um, so the more we unpick, um, the more similar, in fact, the armies um, actually seen, and the contrast is not so, so stark. And the same is true when we look at weaponry. And again, here is one of the ways in which battlefield archaeology has helped us to understand this a bit more. So the Swedish army is supposed to have been armed with more modern weapons, so lighter caliber muskets um, with light artillery and close support. Uh, well, in fact, around three quarters of the Swedish infantry present at the battle appear to have been armed with the heavier caliber muskets uh, compared to the Imperial Army, which actually uh, similar proportion. So three quarters are armed with lighter caliber muskets and hardly any of the contemporary accounts mention the Swedish light artillery. The only time when it features at all is that it, it, it appears that Pappenheim is killed by um, one of the rounds from these light guns that the Swedes had. The Imperial Army appears to have had some kind of light support weapons as well. And all the accounts mention the Imperial heavy batteries. They're the ones that really do the serious damage to the Swedish infantry as they're advancing. So again, when we look at the weaponry, um, the picture becomes less clear. And the same is also then when we're thinking about tactics as well. So the Swedish army is supposed to have been employing more linear tactics, relying on firepower, um, combined with cavalry, relying on speed and shock tactics, a combination that then characterizes European warfare into the Napoleonic era. And the engraving that you can see on the um, left-hand side, this is in um, Marianne's famous Theatre Europeum, and this is widely reproduced. If you go to the Leeds Armoury Museum in the UK, um, you can see this engraving up on the wall. And this is highly inaccurate. Um, it has at the top of the screen there, the Swedish army accurately dis displayed. And that's because um, this information uh, derives from the Protestant Swedish side. If you go to the battlefield of Lutzen, it's fairly flat. There's, there's no high point that you can climb up on and see the land. So the Swedes would have been standing there and not seeing anything other than the front line of their opponents. They'd have no idea what type of formations that they were deployed in. And Marianne has simply used um, uh, formations uh, which are at least 40 or 50 years out of date. Um, if you look at the other picture, um, this is uh, a painting that was commissioned by one of the imperial officers. And here the, the image is reversed. So you see um, the foreground shows you the, um, the imperial army and the Swedish army is in the, in the, in the background. Um, the imperial army is, is depicted, and we know this from other information, um, accurately. And they're in an entirely different type of formation. Um, so we can, if we, if we flip these around, you can see... The actual Marianne's engraving, um, the lines that are at the um, sort of bottom uh, right hand side are the Swedish army, so accurately deployed. His depiction of the Imperial Army is completely wrong, um, and we have that deployed in a more checkerboard fashion, um, using, in fact, formations which were a little bit deeper than the Swedes, but still basically linear formations. If we think more about why it should be remembered as a, as a Swedish victory, well, um, one of the answers I think lies in the military culture of the time, the military conventions of the day. Wallenstein had retreated, leaving the battlefield in the possession of the Swedes at the, um, during the night. He pulls back through um, Leipzig and leaving the battlefield was um, a marker of victory that the, the Swedes were left at the, they could claim at the end of the day, 
um, they had uh, uh, held the ground and their enemy had retreated. And in retreating, of course, Wallenstein leaves behind a lot of the wounded. More of the wounded are then left in Leipzig, who are then captured or murdered when Leipzig is, is taken fairly soon. Um, so this evens up the losses. The Swedes had lost very heavily, um, but they're able to look after most of their wounded. Wallenstein, by abandoning most of his wounded, um, adds to his, his losses. But there are still around about the same overall. Wallenstein had also abandoned his heavy artillery. Um, so those are taken as trophies and displayed. If we look at the other marker of the time of trying to determine um, the victory, this was um, in the capturing of flags. So the Imperial Army in the battle actually only lost four or maybe six flags at the most. Um, the Swedes claim to have taken many more. Of course, they do capture more later on when they capture those garrisons that surrender because they have to hand over their flags. But by contrast, the Imperial Army took at least 30 flags in the battle, perhaps as many as 60. Um, and flags, generally speaking, were only taken either if you surrendered, which is in the case of those garrisons that surrendered, or if the unit was destroyed or fled in battle. So the few imperial standards that are taken are taken from cavalry regiments that fled. Uh, the other uh, standards are taken basically from Swedish infantry units, which are shot to pieces uh, and defeated in the main fight in the center of the battlefield. So this indicates that the Swedish units were actually seriously degraded in the battle um, and suffered um, uh, and would actually not have been in a fit state to fall the next day. Wallenstein didn't know that though. Um, the outcome was already controversial to contemporaries and the Swedes go into overdrive in their propaganda to present it as a great victory. And they have to do this because after all, they have lost their king. And there was a real danger that their entire position in Germany would unravel as a consequence. Their alliance system was extremely um, fragmented. And so their claims to, to victory were to reassure these uh, wavering allies. Plus, moreover, their great king could not have died in vain. The cult of Gustavus and his sacrifice was used to legitimate Sweden's claims to recompense. So throughout the rest of the war, the Swedes are saying, look, our king died for your, your benefit. You've got to pay us. You've got to reward us for this. And the way in which his memory is preserved afterwards is almost like as a kind of Protestant saint. So the preservation of his clothing, some of this is captured, but... Um, the way his body is treated afterwards, the way it's taken back to Sweden uh, and buried. And of course, he had to die heroically leading a charge rather than what was the most likely reality was that he blundered around short sightedly, got detached from his men in the, in the smoke and gets um, shot uh, and stabbed by a succession of imperial passing by. Commemorating the, the battle as a, as a great victory um, as we move later on um, was also because it fits the standard historical narratives of the time, especially the, the idea that was propagated by the early professional historians, so Leopold von Ranke and the other greats of the 19th century and then later on by the sociologist Max Weber, you know, that Protestantism represents modernity and Catholicism is somehow backward. And so it fits the kind of liberal nationalist agendas um, uh, that are current, especially in, in Germany, but also and naturally enough in Sweden. Um, and it becomes entwined in the debates on, on Germany's future, the clash between Protestant Prussia and Catholic Austria. So it, the Thirty Years' War is sort of refought in intellectual terms in the middle of the 19th century when the fate of Germany is being decided on more battlefields. Um, and it also uh, fitted in with um, local commemorative culture. So very little had been done for the first 200 years, but the 200th anniversary, so 1832, is in the beginnings of this sort of national awakening in Germany. So there are a group of local enthusiasts and people who are interested and they want to commemorate the battle and they want to link that to these current debates. And it leads to um, 
the organization of a public subscription and the leading architect of the day, Schinkel designs what you can see there, which is the Gustavus um, Memorial over this stone, which is supposed to have marked where he fell. It's very unlikely that he actually got killed there. It's probably somewhere else, but um, that's what they thought at the time. Um, and these activities rapidly assumed a, a sort of broader political context and they continued. And it's very interesting that the celebrations or the commemorations of the battle are always on the 6th of November. So they take the Protestant, the old Protestant calendar and not the, uh, the modern Gregorian calendar, which dated, which was, of course at the time was used by the Catholics, which would have been the 16th of November. And they continued in broadly similar format throughout all the subsequent regimes. So through Imperial Germany, the Weimar um, Republic era, Nazi Germany, um, and even East Germany. And today, so there's usually a strong Swedish contingent and, um, and you can see there um, on the slide. So what can we con conclude from, from all of this? Well, first of all, I think that reappraising the battle gives us a better idea of the nature of military change during the Thirty Years' War. The war's middle phase, so in the 1630s, represented, I think, a convergence of different military practice rather than the replacement of one system by another. Change was the product of the interweaving of different kinds of practice from all major armies, an amalgam, if you like. And the Swedes, for example, um, had fully abandoned some of the tactics that they had got. And after all, they had evolved them to fight the Poles and they weren't actually working when they came to Germany. So of course they had to change them. And this process is repeated, in fact, in the British civil wars, um, where the belligerents, many of whom had been officers fighting in the Swedish side, come back to Britain and try to fight, or almost even copying out of a textbook, what the Swedes were doing and then realize this doesn't work and we have to do something else. So they adopt what could loosely be called a German method of, of, of forming the units and how to fight. There's some broader conclusions too. I think it's easy to read things with hindsight and to assume that one method or one type of weapon was inherently superior. We have to remember that change is generally disruptive and its full consequences are often only clearer later. Um, so uncertainty and the resistance to change is not necessarily a sign of backwardness. It's a waiting to see whether some new method will prove itself. And it was difficult to adopt new methods wholesale. And as I say, in many cases, these were, were not suitable. The Swedish methods were not, uh, were not suitable. Um, and finally, the definition of decisiveness really is a, a construct. There is no such thing as a decisive battle as such. Um, this is some, it's not a time that's given, it's something that depends very much on circumstances and on how it is viewed by those involved. Thank you. All right, I'll try and come out of this. Yeah. Good stuff and fantastic. Thank you very much for um, delivering this talk, Professor. All right. All right. Yeah. Okay, great, good. Good stuff. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I think the thing that really surprised me the most about um, your discussion tonight is almost the fact that a lot of the battles uh, renown is due to um, sort of the ideas that were then sort of implemented on top of it um, instead of the battle itself. And I think that that's something that's really fascinating and obviously something that has come to define, I think, kind of um, modern Western history, you know, as a kind of established tradition. So I think the first question which I would um, like to ask, if you don't mind, is why do you think we have this real fascination with great battles, you know, particularly in kind of the traditional way of doing um, Western history? Well, that, I think that's a really, really good question. Um, and there's something very much, I think, in the Western tradition about this. You get this also in, you know, if we go all the way back, so we go back to Herodotus, um, and he, he puts into the mouths of one of the Persian generals at the time of the, the Persian invasion of Greece in the whatever, 5th century BC, you know, that, the, you know, why do these silly Greeks sort of try to find a flat field to line up in, in, in orderly, you know, that this is not how you make war, you know, so it is this sort of idea that there is a particular way in which, um, of how you should fight and what's considered honourable, and then your tactics are also evolved around that. 
So in that case, you know, hoplite warfare, you, you know, would easily disrupt in broken terrain, wouldn't, wouldn't work, um, but works very well on, on that type of ground. Um, so there, there, there is that. Um, and there's also this desire um, to achieve a quick success. So if you can try to catch as many of your opponents as possible in a single place and defeat them, you know, you, this, this appears to promise success, whereas, you know, a war of raids and skirmishes um, doesn't appear to give that type of um, quick decision. And so there's a desire, or naturally enough, to try to end the conflict as fast as possible. Mm, absolutely. I imagine it's, um, it's always quite convenient to be able to have these kind of big decisive victories. It's obviously it creates a much better narrative than perhaps lots of little bitty kind of changes and things like that. Um, and obviously, I think one thing that's really interesting is the fact that if you look at the Thirty Years' War as a conflict, um, I think obviously, you know, there were definitely some battles which changed the course of things. But I think a lot of it was this kind of piecemeal raiding. And I was wondering if you could um, perhaps tell us a bit more about um, the experience that most people would have had of the Thirty Years' Wars, perhaps ordinary peasants and things like that. As I think that that was um, very different to perhaps the princes and mercenaries that kind of fought on the field. Yes, well, a lot, a lot of the, the the princes and the elite um, up sticks and goes somewhere safer. Um, so, uh, yeah, so the, the, there's there's a sense of betrayal. In fact, um, uh, you get this, and this is one of the reasons why um, uh, the kind of local communities and so on do break down. So, in in most cases, I mean, I, I think the best way to sort of un understand this is to think that um, if most farms would have the equivalent of of like the equivalent of say 500 rations so um, if you had five people living on the farm you had enough food stored up for 100 days um, if you have a, a a single infantry regiment with camp followers and so on you've got maybe 2,000 uh, people uh, you know you, you the single farm can't even support them so you have the arrival of troops it's, it really is the, the plague of locusts they're going to eat up the area and you might be able to cope with that once or twice, but this constant throughput of, of, of forces going through, even if they're not being particularly destructive, um, is, is very degrading um, to any kind of social fabric and, and, and economic activity. And you can see that the worst affected areas are those on major transit routes. Um, those communities that were further, more isolated, um, generally fared a, a bit better. Absolutely, yeah. So I imagine that for sort of ordinary people just trying to live their lives, this must have been an enormously devastating thing to happen, just sort of... It is, it is. I mean, in no way would I want to sort of diminish the impact of it. It is a horrible, really horrible conflict. Um, but we do have to remember that it's not fought um, continuously in every area for 30 years. So there is a kind of episodic character to it. So in the first half of the conflict, it's fought in no more than, say, three of the 10 or 11 regions of Germany. Um, the arrival of Gustavus, and especially after the, the spectacular victory of, of the Battle of Breitenfeld, is that's when it fans out, because he has to rely on, on allies to provide his troops, and each of these allies has their own local agenda, uh, and equally they are engaged against um, supporters of the emperor in the different regions so the emperor has to protect those um, and so you regionalize the conflict and that's one of the things that meant, then makes it a lot less decisive in fact because you cannot get your large numbers together in one place because they're scattered around fighting these different um, regional conflicts and a victory in one area is going to be offset by a defeat somewhere else so this the trying to gain a preponderance um, becomes extremely difficult Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. That's really interesting stuff because I think also when you think of like the Thirty Years' War and um, you know kind of the great battles, you almost imagine like singular armies kind of moving in unison and kind of fighting these big epic set pieces. But I think, of course, it does bear mentioning, as you said, that this was very regional. It was very kind of scattered with lots of little um, theaters at the same time. But of course, that doesn't make for um, a particularly compelling narrative afterwards. <laughs> No, exactly. And, 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 and a lot of this is, it is about storytelling. I mean, people were telling stories at the time, 
um, and these the, the the you know the, they're personalized. I mean, so I think the characters of Gustavus and Wallenstein, to some extent, also Pappenheim and the other figures who are involved, were very very important at the time. I mean, some of the you know the engraving that I showed of, of Pappenheim, these these are engravings that are made at the time, and there is a kind of mass market media, um, print media that develops that. Um, enabled you to to see these images and even if you couldn't read the text is usually rhymed so that somebody could read it out aloud to you and you can get your news that way and you can you can see these things and we know from um the surviving books for example uh, notebooks and so on people would cut these things out and paste them in and write their own accounts of what was happening and so there's a, there's very much an engagement um, with this, and it's a, it's a rumor, story. All of this is, is it was it was how people were perceiving this, as well as obviously in in the real hard, harsh, objective way of actually being in physical danger and harm. That's really fascinating stuff. Um, we have a couple of questions from Luis. Uh, professor, my my first question is about the tactical level, but uh, it's. Um, can you call to Gustav Adolf the father of the regiment system or the initiator of the line infantry or something like that? No? No, I'm afraid not, no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, these, these things have uh, very long um, origins and, and it's very difficult to say that, you know, one individual mm -hmm. uh, found them. And, and, and again, I mean, this is, it is a sort of vestige of the great man school of history you know we like to have these great figures that we can you know so and so did That's this it. yeah but i mean you know we have so permanent regiments um obviously they're the, they originated really in the spanish army i would say um mm -hmm. so with the tercios from the 1530s um the french try to have legions as they were called um as permanent regiments we have other types of red of military units which are permanent, which are even older, so in the late 15th century. Um, but the, the Austrian Habsburgs, for example, had permanent forces. They, the thing is that they're deployed in, in Hungary most of the time in the 16th century, and um, the, by and large, Western European history ignores everything that happens in Hungary. And so, you know, it's only more recently and now that Hungarian scholarship has become and Croatian scholarship has become much more widely available that we know a lot more about the, the permanent forces that existed to defend against the Ottomans. So the growth of permanent forces and permanent military units as well as just a permanent force is, is a sort of 16th and, and uh, yeah, 16th century development, I would say. And yeah. um, um... The other question I, I want to ask you is that uh, because of the aftermath of Lutzen, uh, the aftermath of the Swedish, the fall of the Swedish king, Gustav Adolf, because uh, my question exactly, exactly is um, what happened in, in Sweden after the, the king was lost? The, the, the position of the, the Swedish realm in, in the Baltic was uh, more, more uh, was less important or not. And the, and the things with Russia and, uh, and Poland and Denmark was, what was the aftermath on the Baltic? Right, well, if you'd been in the beginning of the 17th century, you would you would have put all your smart money would have been on the Danes, you know the king of Denmark is Europe's richest man, um, because he he gets money from every ship that sails in and out of the Baltic, um, you know the sound tolls um, this 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 gave him an independent income, and Denmark is by far the, the stronger military power, and the Swedes have been fighting in um, Poland, um, because the, the, there's a basically there's a dynastic war between. The, the man who is king of Poland, who used to be king of Sweden, um, who's a Catholic, and, and the other branch of the family, which is now controlling Sweden. And they haven't got very far. So they don't really look like a, a very good bet. Um, the surprising thing really is, is, I think, it's less to do with Gustavus, and it's to do with the resilience of, of, of Sweden as a state. The fact that this was actually a relatively inclusive state. Um, it has a very small elite um, but they all bought into the war. Um, and Oxenstierna, 
while he lacked Gustavus's charisma and you know he wasn't taken in the same way as as, as a king would have been, is an extremely hardworking and um, very capable individual, and he guides Swedish policy in a highly effective way. So the Swedes come out of the conflict really in a much much stronger position. By 1648, they control much of the German, North German coast, and they are briefly um, a, a, a great power. And that lasts really until the beginning of the 18th century, when it, you know, you, when taking on Russia was really a step too far. <laughs> yes. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, Peter. Good stuff. Thank you very much, Luis. Um, I suppose one thing which I'll be interested to know about is um, obviously after uh, Lützen, um, Adolphus is held as this great Protestant martyr, and that really plays into the narrative that spun afterwards. Um, but I, one thing I'd be quite interested to hear about is, was, is there any sort of evidence that Adolphus's death had any bearing on Swedish morale during the battle itself? Did it have any particular impact or did they just sort of carry on fighting irrespective? No, it, it definitely has an impact, um, and they try to keep this quiet, basically. So there's, there's rumours that he hasn't been seen, and then his horse is seen running around. Um, uh, so that immediately creates this, this sense that, you know, what's happened to him? Where is he? Um, and uh, then his, his body is eventually recovered and brought back to the, to the Swedish lines, um, and so the, 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 um, a few of the, of the commanders who, who are then told what's happened basically put out the message that he's just been injured. Um, and then there's a, a, supposedly the, there's a counterattack, which is like to rescue his body and, uh, and take revenge. But that, that I think, again, is, is largely a fabrication of, of, of you know, they, they're just trying to win the battle, really, at that point. Um, and then the next day, the whole army is informed, but it's safe to do so, of course, by that point, because it's become obvious that the Imperial Army is left. Um, and yeah, it, this is a really big deal. Um, he is seen as a kind of talisman of victory. I mean, th th this is the thing we have to remember that this is one of the reasons why he dies. Is he's already been wounded in battle several times. Um, and he can't wear armor, it's too painful. Um, so, and, and um, this kind of preservation of, of his clothing as a holy relic has begun already while he's still alive. If you go to the Royal Armories in Stockholm, you can see several suits of clothing that Gustavus had worn um, and which has bullet holes in it. Um, so there have grown up these stories that, you know, a cannonball enters his tent and then swerves to miss him, you know, he's protected by God and this sort of thing. And, and, mm -hmm. and so the fact that he's, he's dead is, is, of course, a, you know, it's a huge shock. Um, and it immediately sets in this kind of infighting amongst the senior command, um, particularly um, Bernhard of Weimar, who, who is determined to become the main commander and Oxenstierna knows that he's, you know, not to be trusted and tries to keep him firmly in a box. And, you know, the, the sort of this is part of the reason why the Swedes unravel after Nerdlingen, because they're already got this kind of problem in, in controlling their commanders. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think it definitely sort of reminds me of how, you know, even companies today, there'll be real kind of questions asked when, you know, a CEO steps down, yeah. there's a change in management, just because when you have somebody like that, that's so integral to, you know, the whole unit, the whole sort of, um, what's the word I'm looking for, kind of unity of that organisation, it can definitely be really devastating. I think that's a great example of how, you know, when you've got one really decisive leader, that can be great, but obviously it can all fall apart. Oh, definitely. And I, I think it shows the importance of the individual in history. I mean, they, they, uh, you know, you take somebody out of the picture and it makes a difference. Um, yeah. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, I think um, Nuna had a question. Good night. Yes, uh, I do have a question. Uh, from, my, from what I heard and what I read, uh, can we call this battle uh, a religious battle since there were Protestants versus Catholics, uh, Protest uh, even France came to the aid of Protestants. Uh, the Catholic Church, uh, the Catholic kings of Spain uh, sent help to the Catholic side, to the Catholic League. 
uh, and I wanted to know if we can call this war a religious war. Mm. Yes and no at the same time. <laughs> I mean, first of all, you know, it, it's um, you can't detach religion from um, from the rest of life in the 17th century. So a fully kind of atheist position. Um, or a position where somebody was cynically using religion as a um, just to legitimate some other kind of policy is unthinkable. I mean, that's just not how people thought. Um, so they all have a religious outlook, um, and they all uh, religion matters um, because religion is the foundation of morality and political legitimacy and, and so forth. So in that sense, it's religious. But then so is every other conflict in early modernity. So, uh, you know, that doesn't actually say very much. I think more importantly is the fact that religious rights within the empire, which include um, the right of patronage over the church, access to resources, um, the ability to influence um, populations uh, in, in a whole way. These are bound up with the constitution. So the argument over the imperial constitution, um, a major part of that argument is over the exercise of these religious rights and who is, who's entitled to do so. So again, it's, it's a simultaneously a political and a religious issue. It's not religious in the sense that it's not a kind of holy war. And I think there's a difference yes. between the, the Thirty Years' War and the French Wars of Religion. I mean, the French Wars of Religion seem to have a particular kind of viciousness that are, that are really genuinely within communities and divide communities and those people living in them. Whereas in the Thirty Years' War, all the established churches take the same view. They say to their own population, it's your fault, you're sinners, and God's brought this terrible war on us, and you must be pious and obedient and pay your taxes and behave. Um, and that's really very different. That's not a summoning to arms. On the contrary, where there, where, when there are suggestions of doing that, um, they all back away. No, this must be fought using regular forces. And so, yes, of course, the composition of the arm is, you know, the Swedish army is basically Protestant, but there is nonetheless a Catholic general in the Swedish army who's a, who's a Scot who, you know, he has a difficult time of it and he goes off and fights for the French instead. But likewise, the, the, um, the imperial army has a lot of Protestants. The, 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 the last but one imperial commander um, is actually a Calvinist, um, Melanda von Hatzfeld, uh, Holzapfel, um, sorry. Um, so, you know, the, the, there are um, the, the situation is, 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 is much more complicated than the classic you know, yes, Protestants yes. against Catholics. Okay, thank you very much. We now have um, a third question from Luis. Um, my third question is, a, is, is about uh, uh, another thing about the aftermath and so on. It, um, do you think as if you talk about the, the, the national, nationalistic idea of Gustav Adolphus, do you think that the model for Charles XII against the, the, the Russians uh, in the Great, Great Northern War was Gustav Adolphus? He was, if he was thinking that was, he was the, the, the new Gustav Adolphus. Yeah. Definitely, absolutely. One of the one of the images, actually, I meant to say something about it, but one of the images I showed um, has Gustavus and Charles the Twelfth on it, um, and Charles the Twelfth, um, after his initial victory in in Poland at the beginning of the um, Great Northern War, so at the beginning of the eighteenth century, um, so the war is is, is becomes a, a struggle about who will be king of Poland. Will it be the Elector of Saxony? Or will it be um, a, a client of the of the Swedish king? And so the Swedes, the Swedes have won in Poland. They've beaten the Saxons, and they they move into Saxony and to to force the Saxons to make peace. And Gustavus comes to the battlefield, and he talks to the local inhabitants, and he says, you know, I, I know how this battle was fought, and this unit was there, and that unit was there, and you know, he has a lot of lot of information. Charles Charles XII, I mean. Sorry. Um, and he, so he's fascinated by, by Gustavus. And so, yes, I think so. There's the, you know, this image of the warrior king and, and so forth is very much in his mind. Yeah. 
And do you think that uh, in Poltava, uh, Charles XII was thinking that Poltava was his, his uh, Lutzen because he, he, he was wounded in Poltava, I think. Yeah, right. And I don't think anyone would want. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Um, but yes, I, I, there's, there's possibly. I mean, certainly, I think this this idea of being able to, to uh, yeah, from, to to survive a, uh, to survive a defeat. I mean, I think that um, uh, in in his case, I mean, he he would want <laughs> he wouldn't want that outcome. Um, but. Uh, um, Yeah, I mean, I think I think that that Poltava is, is is an example of a of a decisive battle because, and again, it's the you know if you have a very hierarchical political system where the king is actually very important, when you take the king out, um, you know, then fairly dramatic things can happen. And I think Poltava would be an example which I think one could say that you know that you know history really does shift. Um, You know, in the 30s war, it would be, you know, White Mountain right at the beginning, um, you know, creates a settlement that's not really unpicked until, um, well, pretty much. I mean, if you t if you look at who owns what bit of land in, in Bohemia, it's not unpicked until about 1948. Um, okay. Thanks, Professor. Um, as we know, towards the end of their time, Sorry, as we know, towards the end of our time, um, I think one thing which I'd like to ask, perhaps just to kind of wrap up the discussion, is do you think that um, sort of talking about and studying great battles still has a place um, in sort of modern war studies? And if so, what do you think um, ought to constitute a decisive or great battle? Um, I mean, that, that's going to depend on... on, on your purpose of, of, of studying conflict um so i, th I think it, it certainly has it plays a lot less of a role than it would have done in the past so this idea of tradition building and celebrating the past in a, in a very kind of unreflective way um so you don't really get that in in certainly not in in, in the western world and professional military education in that kind of way but nonetheless you know military units armed forces they need to have traditions as part of um, part of the cohesion so there's an element there I don't I, I would hesitate to say that studying them is, is it's a way of learning tactical lessons or strategic lessons I mean the people who've done that Alfred von Schlieffen for example yeah it didn't work out terribly well um, so you know I, I wouldn't recommend that um, but it, it does tell you I think a lot about uh, you can you can think of in terms of the dynamics about um, uh, uh, the limitations of command, I think, as well as the potential. Um, there are very few um, changes once the battle starts uh, and the ability to, to shape events, commander's ability to shape events um, was fairly constrained. And I think that's often a useful reminder because um, a lot of planning sort of is predicated on, on, on success and on things going right. And so these things, I think, uh, can be quite useful reminders of how things can go wrong and what you might, you know, um, be a little bit more cautious about my, what you might be planning to do. And I think from, from the point of view of, uh, uh, of, of just studying history more broadly, then I think it is important. I mean, it's important to remember that, that, You know, we might not like conflict, but it happened, and we need to understand how it happened and what were the consequences. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think um, just going back to something we were discussing um, prior to the interview starting, um, do you think that there's sort of any lessons from the Thirty Years' War that we can take forward to the modern day and looking at modern conflict? Uh, well, probably quite a lot of lessons, I think. Um, but one, one is the danger of interventions. <laughs> I mean, you know, this, this one of the, the, the reason why this war continues, um, it, or a major reason, um, are external interventions. So either interventions to help the emperor to wrap it up quickly, or interventions to prevent him from doing so. Um, and uh, all the interventions really... Uh, don't really work out the way that, that, that the people who were doing them uh, wanted them to. Uh, and the result is, a, is, a, is a, a longer and bloodier conflict. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. 
Fantastic. Um, I'm afraid that takes up our time for tonight. Um, it's a shame we can discuss more as I think it's an enormously interesting topic, both looking at the Thirty Years' War itself um, and, of course, more broadly, the way that we spin narratives about war. I think, you know, it's a discussion which we could have probably through the whole night since the following day. Um, but unfortunately, um, but of course, we don't want to take up too much of your time. So I'd like to thank um, Professor Wilson. Thank you. Thank you ever so much um, for coming to speak to us tonight. Thank you to all of our viewers who have been watching, and we hope you'll join us um, in the next episode of Confabulating. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks very much.